been a good weekend, brethren. <clears throat> the Lord has been good to us. Brother Ricky's sermon text can be found in Psalm 89, verse 48. What is man? What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Selah. It's a very sobering passage, isn't it? <laughs> Causes you to kind of stop and think. That's what Selah means. Consider, consider this. <clears throat> Solomon said, the living know they shall die. In fact, when, it, when a child is born, the minute they're born, they begin to die. They begin to, to enter this road, and eventually at the end of this road, death comes. Death is not a very comfortable subject for the natural man to consider. In my experience, the thought of death is pushed as far away from the consideration as possible. It's just kind of relegated to the very back of the closet, so to speak. <laughs> Nobody likes to talk about it. Nobody likes to think about it. it people do everything they can to avoid this. They, they try to avoid death. Consequently, when death comes, the ability to reason soundly is fleeting, and the worst in people is made known. And I have seen, and this, this grieves my heart, but I have seen a person prefer a TV program over assisting their family member who was on their deathbed. I have heard family members argue in the presence of the one who was getting ready to cross Jordan argue over who the power of attorney should be. This recently, this happened, I heard this happen. <clears throat> I have seen family members at the funeral service of one of God's people be thoughtless and even offensive in their conduct. Why is this? Why do these things happen? Now this isn't, this doesn't happen all the time and this hasn't been my only experience, but the reality of the frailty of one's life and the powerlessness to avoid death is most uncomfortable to the flesh. The flesh has no control over death. It cannot control this. So it doesn't want to talk about it. It doesn't want to think about it. It's more comfortable to make jokes at a funeral than it is to look death in the face. This question here that is posed to us by the psalmist, <clears throat> although it's somewhat of a rhetorical question, the Apostle Paul answers it in the book of Hebrews. He said, it's appointed unto men once to die. Every man, it's appointed unto them, save the generation that is still alive when Christ comes. <clears throat> but after this, the judgment. Brethren, there is no escape. All men must pass through death. No man is left untouched by death. In fact, we're told that death has passed upon all men. No man, save our Lord, has the power within himself to avoid death, nor the power to deliver his soul from the grave. The hand of the grave has a stronger grip than the determination of man. Death is the effect, but what is the cause of death? Everything, there's a cause and effect. We talk about causes and effects. What is that? When a person dies, the family is given a death certificate. On that death certificate, it's made known the cause of death. Maybe it was a heart attack, you know, maybe it was some disease or something, but the, the cause is made known. Well, on the divine death certificate, the cause of death is sin. Yes. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. James wrote, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Brethren, the wages of sin is death. In other words, sin cost something. There's a price tag placed on sin. There, there's something that has to be paid because of sin. Sin has a hefty price, and we were told this by the Lord. Remember, this passage has been referenced several times this week. But God told Adam and Eve... In the day that you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. There's the cost. The sin costs something. God is very serious about sin. And his people 
ought to, and those who know it are serious about sin. It bothers the people of God when they find sin in themselves and when they see sin expressed in others. I feel like that the Lord is helping us, brethren, to see more fully the seriousness and the wickedness of sin. Now, sin runs the gamut. It can be maybe just something that nobody notices, or it can be as big as blaspheming the Holy Spirit. All right, sin, it, it is sin, and it separates us from God. But the Lord is helping his people to see the seriousness and wickedness and the depths to which he had to go to re retrieve us from the pit into which we had fallen. As we grow in the Lord, sin becomes more obnoxious to us and more finite. You've experienced this. Things that you used to do in the past that you didn't think were necessarily sinful or wrong, now they are. Because why? Because you've grown. You've grown in your understanding. You've gotten closer to the Lord. And now that you're closer to the Lord, the same things that bother him, well, now they bother you too. Yeah. This, is how, this is how the Lord works. It's because we're being conformed to the image of our Lord, as Sister Emily brought out. But brethren, praise be to God. This passage just kind of ends. There's nothing after it. There's no kind of hope extended. But we know that the divine purpose, the Lord was unwilling for the fall of man to be at the end. <laughs> In fact, he shared this. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Brethren, Jesus is our savior. He is our redeemer. He is our holy one from on high. He is that scapegoat that was taken without the city. He is the lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. He is our deliverer and our reconciler. He has paid the debt that we could not pay in order for us to be reunited or united again with God. No longer do we, the people of God, have to fear death. Because of Jesus' victory over the grave, death belongs to the saints. The same power that raised Jesus is the same power that raises his people. Brethren, the people of God are the only ones that have hope past the grave. All of the songs, did you notice the songs that we sang tonight? They all talked about death, didn't they? I'll fly away. <laughs> all, all of these songs, they talked about death, but didn't it? Didn't it stir up that desire to welcome, welcome it with, with gladness? Because we know that, that past the grave, we are with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So brethren, the, the grave no longer has a sting. It no longer has a sting because Jesus paid the price. So I want to leave you with this hope. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. One more time, Brother Ricky's text is Psalm 89, 48. What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall, the deliver, shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Selah. It's been my desire with this message to have a greater appreciation for the one that said, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. If the scriptures are truly written of Jesus, then any one of us, by the wisdom of God, can do what Philip did. You can take the man that's reading a passage in Isaiah 53, and you can take him directly to Christ. And that's what I want to be able to do here as we look at this passage, Psalm 89, 48, is to declare the mortality of man and then bring us to the one who has life. That's, that's, that's my desire. I think all of us want to do this when we step into the pulpit. We want to create a context where Jesus is appreciated and where believers can believe on him more. We can, all, we can always believe on Jesus more. And I'm going to tell you, with mortality, God has put us in the best context to appreciate the resurrection and the life. Now what man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? 
be thought of the grave as having a hand. It's got a hand. It's going to reach out and take hold of you someday and bring you down into it. That's, how, that's, that's the way the grave is. You see, death is just as much a part of human experience as life for us all. In Ecclesiastes, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. In fact, we have just recently, we, we have actually seen a transition from one season to another, haven't we? Although we are not supposedly technically yet in winter, but by the appearance of all things, we have made a transition from fall to a, a more milder cold temperature to something that's more severe, like we're seeing outside, see? And that's the way life and death are to the human race. We're in life now, and there will be a transition of seasons, and we'll, we'll pass through death because it's very much a part of our life. Think of the different examples we have that I'm gonna show you that, that show that we actually plan around the fact that we're all mortal. For example, we all have life insurance, don't we? Why do we have life insurance? Because men die. That's why we have it. All of us, most of us at least, if our wedding vows were traditional, we said this phrase, Till death do us part. Why do we have an ambulance service? Because men can be very rapidly drawn into the grave. And so there is that kind of a service out there. Have any of you seen, if you've gotten really close to a, uh, a big trucker on the road, look in the back and seen these hazmat triangles on the, on the back of the truck? Sometimes maybe you've seen the red one that's got the fire on it. You know what those are? Hazardous materials. Yeah. Hazardous to who? You and your life. Yeah. If you run into the back of a diesel truck that's carrying who knows how many thousands of gallons of gas, you're more than likely going to die. And so they have those on there. See, death, death is all about us. That's, that's all I'm saying. That's why we have hospitals. Have you ever heard a man say, I don't like to go to hospitals? See, it's astounding that death is all about us, and yet men don't like to think about death, as Sister Tasha said. They don't like to think about it. Maybe you've heard a man say, I don't like to go to funerals. I don't go to funerals. Why? Because it reminds them of death. Or maybe you've heard a man say, when someone's talked about death, they said, that's morbid. That's just morbid. You know what morbid means? Here's the dictionary for morbid. Showing a strong interest in unpleasant and gloomy subjects such as death. Well, that's a pretty biased definition, isn't it? That kind of tells you what men think about it, huh? They're uncomfortable with the subject of death. It's gloomy. And in a sense, it is gloomy. In spite of the fact that man tries to push the consideration of death from his mind, God, with this passage and many other in the scriptures, is drawing our attention to our own mortality. Think of how many times in the scriptures death is mentioned. The word death comes up 342 times in the Bible. Just the word death. Could have been avoided. God didn't have to say it, but he did. Die, 299 times. Died, 189 times. Dead, 331 times. It's mentioned. It's mentioned. People die, God mentions it. God mentioned when all the patriarchs died, he mentioned them. He mentioned their death. God wants people to think about it. What man is he that liveth shall not see death? An entire book in the Bible is devoted to a man's wrestling with his own mortality, and I've got some different quotes that come actually from that book. It's the book of Job where God hides himself from him and allows Satan to bring him to the very, very closely and very nearly to the hand of the grave, and he is wrestling as God has hidden himself from him with his mortality, the entire book. God wants men to think about their mortality. And the question before us is this, what man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Not what man is he that liveth and die, but what man is he that liveth and shall not see death. 
I like the way the Spirit says that. In other words, will he pre can he prevent it in some way? The one that's living. Do we have any dead folk in here? We're all part of the living, right? Well, okay, well, this is a question for you. What man as you are that is living and shall not see death? What man? The elderly see death? We kind of expect that, but don't also the young see death as well? Have you ever heard a man talk about his covetousness over someone who's young? They're so youthful and so young and full of life. Not all young people are full of life. Remember Jairus' daughter? 12 years old. She wasn't run over by a carriage, brethren. She was sick and ready to die. Happens to elderly, it happens to the younger. In the Psalms, we have this word, I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. And that is to say, like Sister Tosh had said, and I've heard someone say this, when a man begins to live, he at the same time begins to die. He does. Hairs that fall out that die. Skin that dies. There are a number of things about you that are in the process of degeneration as soon as you come into the world. That's just the way it happens. You ever been to a children's hospital? The rich and the poor die alike. Wasn't this part of Solomon's torment? See, God set up Solomon to show the vanity of life in the context of death. This man had everything that he wanted. All these vineyards and these various things that he got for himself, and yet after it was all said and done, he said, I hated all my labor, which I had taken under, under the sun, because I should leave it under the man that should be after me. That's the vanity. See, I'm glad God talks about death. It'll actually encourage us to not covet earthly things. Yeah. It is an astounding thing to me to present a gospel to people that God gives to men something that they have to leave when they die. Even Solomon was far enough along to realize that is stupid. You see, but a rich man with all of his riches and all the advantages he has from earthly life cannot avert his own death. The wise man dies just like the fool. Psalm 49.10, he sees that wise men die Likewise, the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. An educated man with all of his education cannot stop the course of mortality. See, the educated man has found a cure for all kinds of diseases, but he has not found a cure for mortality, has he? Yes, it's a good reason, brother, not to boast in earthly wisdom. They have no right to boast until they have cured mortality. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm, all I'm doing is setting, a con setting up a context where Jesus shines so brightly. Yeah, Doesn't our Savior do what no man can do? Yeah. I'm just telling you what no man can do, that's all. How about this? The righteous and the unrighteous alike die. Ecclesiastes 9.2, all things come, to, come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean and to the unclean, and to him that sacrificeth and to him that sacrificeth not. As is the good, so is the sinner. He that sweareth as he that feareth an oath. James dies by the sword. Herod dies. They both died. The righteous man and the unrighteous man, they both die together. Here's my point, brethren. Death is no respecter of persons. They all die. And that's why we should not boast in men. No matter how educated he is, no matter how strong he is, no matter how healthy he is, no matter how much money he has, all the things that men boast in don't mean anything when they come to the grave. Have you noticed that? Men don't, men don't tend to boast at funerals. Have you noticed that? that? That's kind of a tendency. I know there are certain loud people that they'll still be loud even at funerals. But I've seen some people that are pretty loud out in public that are pretty quiet at a funeral. Yeah. Yeah. 
Have you noticed that? Let's look a little more about what God has said about death. Now, I've said all die, and so here's just the word on this. In Adam, all die. That's the word. And, that, and that is, that's like the answer to this question. Okay? That's the answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 22 is simply the answer to Psalm 89 as we're looking at it. They all die. Another one of those rhetorical questions that the answer seems obvious, but God wants us to think about this. Thinks about, think about our mortality. Think about the fragile nature of life in this world. Okay? Isaiah was exhorted by God. I think I received this exhortation by somebody when I was younger in the faith. But Seech ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? That's something? Say, you want to know how fragile life is? Plug your nose for two minutes and you'll see. You will make a transition from life to death. Hey, you got to remember that, brethren. You know, persecution's on the rise these days. We're seeing kind of Satan's got the melting, the melting pot of wickedness is kind of getting, it's kind of boiling. Maybe someday you're going to face your persecutor. And, and God will, God will, God will, you'll, you'll be, join, maybe you'll be joining the martyrs. But before you die, you look at your enemy in the face and you see that they have nostrils. And don't fear them. Because their life is fragile as from one breath to the next. See, don't regard man. Breath is in his nostrils. Psalm 103, 15 and 16. For as for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. And then comes the wind. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone. The place thereof shall know it no more. That's something. So two weeks ago, I was going to go out and cut my grass. And, uh, and I, you know how it is. You get busy and things like this. You didn't get the lawnmower. Didn't get the lawnmower. Another week goes by. You didn't get the lawnmower. And you know how it's starting to kind of grow up and get kind of thick. And then pretty soon, we had, we had a couple of days that were pretty cold and windy. No need to mow the lawn anymore. The grass is dead. Two days. That's how human life is. That's how human life is. See, mortality just kind of blows on him. Some kind of sickness rises up. See? Suddenly, and the man has two weeks to live. See? Just blows on him, and he's gone. That's, that's how our life is. Particularly when you compare it to eternity. Our life is no more than a hand's breath. It's just <laughs> here and gone. It's like a vapor. It's like grass that withereth. You know why we have memorials, brethren? Because men have done great things, but they died and went away, and we've already forgotten them. We just celebrated Veterans Day. That's like the flower of the field. It's like the honorable part of, of a man. See? He's giving his life in service. And we have memorials because we already forget them. Why? They're dead. Right? That's like the, the flower of the field fading away. That's how human life is. It's like that. I hope you, hope you don't mind me saying these things. I, this is, I don't intend to be morose in the way that men like to think about morose, but this is how God talks. God wants men to be faced with their mortality. Okay? How about the finality of death? Job chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. As the cloud is consumed and vanished away, so he that goeth down to the grave shall come up no more. He shall return no more to his house, neither shall his place know him any more. You know, there's going to be some no mores pretty soon for all of us. No mores. There's going to be some no mores. He doesn't return to his house. It's not just his physical house, but it's like his habitation, the things that he regularly circulates in. One day you're going to make your last trip to Walmart. Last time, not going to go there again. Last trip to Aldi's, never going there again. This is going to be your last trip to the copy place. You're not going there again. Not going there again. One day you're going to push that garage button for the last time. You're not going there again. See? See? Some of you, brethren, you're, you're going to preach your last sermon in the body. You'll be the last one. Well, that kind of encourages you to throw yourself into your preaching. Doesn't it? 
It's kind of hard. I know it's kind of hard because, see, we, we are on this side of death, and so we see the good things. So I, well, let's, I'm trying to keep, let's keep the rejoicing down a little bit because this, this, is, this is intended to be very sobering because it is very sobering. It is very sobering, okay? You see, I've, I've quoted these texts in funerals, and people that didn't have faith, it was obvious. The look in their eyes, I, it, it is a very scary thing. Okay? It is. And man should be scared if he doesn't believe on the name of Christ in going into death. Here's something else God has to say about death. He accentuates the helplessness of mortal man, and that's, that's what I'm going to really come down to here in just a second. But there is no man... There's our theme. There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit. Neither, in other words, remember that he's speaking under the sun, because now if you think in terms of the gospel, hey, wait, there is a man, right? There is a man. But under the sun and in, among Adam's race, there is no man that hath that power in the day of death. And there is no discharge in that war. You're not getting out of that battle. No man's getting out of that battle. He's going to face it. See? It shows the helplessness of man. Now, now think, what's, what are some conclusions that we should draw from these things? You know, men come to bad conclusions. Without divine assistance, especially when it relates to death, they come to some horrible conclusions. Let me give you one. Some men, when they think about death, they just think this way. We're just going to ignore it, and we're living in denial. Have you ever heard, I, I hope this isn't dipping too low here, but have you ever heard love songs? People have love song lyrics about earthly life and they use the term forever in it. I'm going to love you forever. Really? You really are going to love them forever? Well, you're going to die or they're going to die. See, earthly people should never use the term forever with regard to anything associated with the earth. There is no such thing. To me, it's like a, to me, it's like denial. It's like denial. Are you, are you kidding? Sorry, there isn't anything forever. Everything that's earthly has like a shelf life to it. Yeah. By divine intention. I'm glad for it, and I know you are too. That's a bad conclusion. How about this one? Just accept it, and we're just going to, okay, we're just going to accept that someday we're going to die, and so we're just going to live it up here. Get everything we can. Isaiah 22, 13, and behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. That's like the American mentality, a pleasure-centered, driven society that doesn't like to think about death. And so what do they do? They get absorbed in entertainment yeah. to distract them from this reality that is a terror to them. The terrors of death, the psalmist talked about. Yeah. So they distract themselves. I'm not saying I'm against entertainment. I'm certainly against being driven by it. But I'm certainly against anything that distracts men from mortality. This is like a context in which man will think soundly if he will carefully listen to what God is saying about this. Some men, when they are faced with death, they simply hasten it. It's too horrible, it's too bad, the suffering's too hard, just end your life. Isn't that what Job's wife said? Curse God and die. You know, we have just had a recent demonstration of that kind of mentality by a young lady of 29 years old named Brittany Minard, who was recently diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And on November 1st, she ended her life. When she was faced with death, here's her conclusion, hasten it. Just get it over with. Is that a good conclusion? No, it's not. I'll tell you this. I'm, I'm not standing in judgment of that woman, but I will tell you this. I would not want to be thrust into eternity just having committed self-murder. And that's what she did. No matter what we face. By the way, you know what terminal, terminal means. Inevitably, but often gradually leading to death. You know who's terminal? Everybody. 
You see, men do not arrive at sound conclusions to critical matters of life and death without divine intervention and revelation. Amen. That's why they think things like this. Thank God, brethren, you have got a message that is associated with death that you can give to men so that they will think soundly about these matters. Now let's let God give us his conclusion about death. Sister Tasha said this, and I say this when I have funerals, I say this at funerals. Death is a divine appointment for every single man. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Okay, we miss appointments. You won't miss this one. You will not be late to this one. Yeah, you might be early, but you will not be late to it. Man can die before his time, but he will ultimately die. It's an appointment. What does that mean? It means that God has hemmed us in. When man sinned, the scripture says that he thrust the man out of the garden and set a cherubim that guarded the tree of life with a sword. You remember why he did that? Lest he put forth his hand and take of the tree of life and live forever. He would have lived forever. God thrust him out. So man has like been hemmed in by God with death. He's the one who's done this, brethren. Can you say that? When you think about your own mortality, can you say something like this? My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. You have done this. You know, I'll tell you, that's actually a comfort to the saints. If I can see that it is God that is leading me in and through the valley of the shadow of death, well, then I can fear no evil, right? Amen. God has hemmed men in. Men are helplessly mortal apart from divine intervention by divine design. You remember when the Lord brought um, Ezekiel, one of these visions where he brought Ezekiel down into this valley that was filled with bones? And he caused the man to pass by them and round about them. And behold, there were very many in an open valley, and lo, they were very dry. He made him look at it and pass through it and know it by experience. Isn't that what my text is doing? What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? It's like he's making us pass through the wreckage of, of humanity and all the dry bones. And remember he asked this question. He said, can these bones live? Remember what Ezekiel, how he responded? Very good response, Ezekiel. Only you know. Now I'm telling you, when God raises our, the level of our awareness about mortality, that is the kind of response that he wants us to have. What does that mean? If these bones are going to live, only you can make this happen. You see, in salvation, what we have is a God doing for men something that men cannot do for themselves. Amen. I'm tired of gospels announcing things that any man can do. This is ridiculous. Amen. A man boasts in all kinds of things that he wants to receive from God, but there's no place where we find ourselves more helpless than in the valley of the shadow of death. What's man going to boast in what he can do there? He's helpless. He can do nothing there but this, cry out to the living God to save them. You notice the psalmist, does, the psalmist does that quite a bit in the Psalms. I should have put those in here, but I didn't. But he, he cries out multiple times about going down. Into, I don't know what all that might have entailed as far as his own experience, but he cried out to God. Here, the, it's like the, the hand of the grave was reaching out to take hold on him, and he cried out to God. That is why God talks about mortality is because man will not cry out to God until he realizes that he is in a dilemma from which he cannot deliver himself. That's what this is. That's what death is. No man can deliver himself, but now here is the good news of the gospel, is that the gospel deals directly with mortality and brings to light life and immortality. Those things are brought to light with the gospel. The gospel does not ignore mortality. It looks at it full face and provides a cure for it. My text is like the diagnosis of humanity. The gospel is like the cure. 
See, God doesn't diagnose it and then leave us. God's not cruel. Brother Jason already brought this out in his first sermon. Another brethren have brought this out. Why is God bringing up these questions, these questions? Is it because he wants to mock us? Does he want to mock us? Is God cruel like that? He just wants to mock us in our mortality. Ha, ah, see, you're going down to the grave and there's not a thing you can do about it. Ha, ah. no, that's not what it is at all. It's so that man will cry out to the only one who has the power to kill or make alive. Amen. This is what brings us to the marvelous Son of God. Because to Jesus alone has been given the power to save from death and to give eternal life. Amen. Thou hast given him power over all flesh that he might give eternal life. Amen. Right? Mm -hmm. To as many as believe. That's the power he's been given. The Father loveth the Son, and the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel, so that we may marvel at the Son of God. Hey, that's a pleasant experience to marvel at the Son of God. Not marvel in unbelief, but to how wonderful he is. Yeah. How wonderful he is. Who's like the Son of God? Who is like unto him? What can he do? For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. You know this, when Jesus died, he bought the heathen. Uh, that, that was the deal. That was the covenant in Psalm 2. And you know when in salvation what he's doing? He's quickening the heathen. Whoever he wants to quicken. They're the ones that get eternal life. Hey, Jesus is the only one that can work at will when it comes to death and life. Brother Aaron already mentioned this text in Revelation chapter 1. You know, Jesus him demonstrated in himself the power that he had to raise men up from dead and to make them alive. I am he that liveth and was dead and am alive forevermore, and have the keys of death and of hell. He can unlock whoever he wants. You know, he actually demonstrated this in a picture in the world. Something I, I noticed here is something I'm, I'm, I'm still looking at, but Jesus did more miracles related to death and life than any other human being in the world. That's on record. Mm -hmm. You have very few resurrections in the scriptures. Just a few in the old, in, in, in the Moses and the prophet, very few. I think we just have like two, don't we? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's right, and touch the bones. Yeah. But now you're talking over a large period of history. <laughs> Jesus comes in in three years. Look what he did. Amen. Yep. I mean, uh, let's, let's just step back from that, from life and death, and just think about the miracles that Jesus did. When they were on that raging sea, it was raging and crashing into the boat, and these were experienced sailors, so this wasn't some little small thing that was taking place. It was, it was actually threatening their lives. And they cried out to the Savior to save them, and of course, he was asleep. But he woke up, and the Scripture says that he rebuked the sea. He rebuked the sea. You ever tried that? He rebuked the sea, and it completely stilled. Yeah. And you remember the response of the disciples? What manner of man is this? Yeah. Amen. Now, that's what the gospel does when it's preached right. Mm. right. Hey, can you imagine some guy, one of the disciples standing up and say, Hey, Jesus, I got a request for you. You did this great thing here. Can you make my brother divide the inheritance with me? Are you kidding me? I mean, but isn't that the kind of thing that people are coming to Jesus for? Silly things. When he, when he can do th something like that. Isaiah said this about Jesus, referring to the miracles that he would demonstrate in the earth. And those were attesting miracles to show what he could do. Isaiah 35, 2, refer to the Lord this way. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of God. I like to think of Jesus that way. The excellency of God. Down in the fourth verse, he said, Say ye to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, he will come and save you. Your God 
So who is that? That's Jesus. And here's what is said that would characterize what he did. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. And then you get this picture of just life and foliage coming forth. What is this about? Is this a, does this mean God's on a campaign to give sight and to give people that are deaf hearing and all that? That's the campaign. That's what God's all about. He can give you back the, the five senses that you've lost because of death. It's Jesus reversing the effects of death. That's what's happening here. He's just like overruling death. That's a marvelous thing, brother. And think about some of the miracles that Jesus did. He comes into Peter's house there and his mother-in-law is sick. You remember what he did? The scripture says he just rebuked the fever. I mean, this was the fever that like made her bedridden. Remember what she did? She got up and started serving. That's, That's the gospel. Right. Amen. That's what God's doing. Yeah. Rebuke. See, if you sat and witnessed those things, you wouldn't be asking Jesus for bubbles. That's right. You see, these miracles, what they do is elevate men's aspirations to, do, to desire something that's beyond earthly life, something that's beyond the parameters of earthly life. That's what these miracles are all about. The woman with the issue of blood, Jesus didn't even do anything then. She just reached out and touched him. And the issue of blood dried up and she knew within herself that she was whole. What had happened there? He just, re he just overruled the effects of death. That's what he did. She just touched him. Or how about the centurion man's servant who was sick unto death? And the centurion man, what a man of faith. If you just say the word... I'm, I know you, brother, and realize, you, you realize how much hope we have toward Jesus with regard to death. He's just got to say the word. Yeah. You know, that's what his coming is going to be. Amen. Huh? Yeah. When the Son of Man comes, the dead shall hear his voice and come forth. It's going to happen. And blind Bartimaeus, Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Now, if I was to say that, that would mean something entirely different than if Jesus says that to somebody. What he was doing, brethren, he was just demonstrating his power over death. This is good news for men that are mortal. We do not have power over death, but he does. And that's what the gospel declares about Jesus. He can loose. Now, I just got a few more things to say and I'll be done. You know, we right now have the first fruit evidences of a life that is greater than death right now. Where death has in fact been overruled and men have been given life right now. Now, Jesus talked about this and he said in John chapter 5 and verse 24, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, let's pay attention to this or this will pass you by and you do not want this to pass you by. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. Is passed. Amen. That's a marvelous thing. You have already experienced a resurrection. We've already experienced, Jesus has already demonstrated this in our, we know within ourselves that this has already been demonstrated. That death has been overruled and we've been given life. You that were dead in trespasses and sins, he hath quickened. Yes, amen. Peter associated our new birth with the power of his resurrection. You've got like a down payment of what's coming, brother. Amen. Amen. You've got a down payment. Some of the evidences of that life. How about this? The law of the spirit of life had made me free from the law of sin and death. Are you able to say no to sin? It's an evidence of life that's greater than death. Because what the appeal of sin is like death trying to encroach and stifle life. That's, that's simply what temptation is. Paul referred to his body as the body of death. Remember what he was talking about there in Romans 7? He's talking about temptation. 
I mean, he couldn't get away with having to deal with it, but in the end, Paul said, it is not I. What does that mean? He said, no. No. And every time you say no, it's like a reminder. It's like a down payment of what's coming. One day, all the effects of death are going to be are going to be removed. Okay. One more. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. You know, the more alive you are to God, the more you'll love the people of God. Amen. Amen. But how can that happen in the midst of a, an environment where death is ruling all about us? Because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And he, he just overrules it. He just overrules it. See, here we are. Death is all about us, and yet we're flourishing in life. It's like a down payment of what's coming. Now, boy, I certainly wanted to say more about this. I, Jesus is a marvelous Savior. In the face of mortality, he's a marvelous Savior, what he can do. But uh, let me just say this last thing. Whenever Jairus was on his way to, uh, to see Jesus, remember he met him, and Jesus was going to come on the way to him to, to go to his house. His daughter had not yet died. She was in the process of dying at this point. And you remember, that's when the woman with the issue of blood came along. I think God kind of sent that woman to encourage Jairus. Because she just touched him, and, and the, the issue was gone, and she was made whole. That was on the way. But also, Satan also has his little discouragers. They come along, see, before, before Jesus does his work sometimes to try and discourage you. If you carefully pay attention, you'll see this happening. When God's going to do something on your behalf, there's always going to be like discouragers to try and come along. See? And scripture says that while he yet spake, in other words, while he was speaking about this circumstance with this woman, who touched me? While he was yet speaking, the scripture says, there came, there came from the ruler of this synagogue's house certain which said, thy daughter is dead. Why trouble ye the master any further? That's like unbelief talking. That's like unbelief talking. It, it, <clears throat> gone too far. It's gone too far. She's dead. It would have been fine if she was still in the throes of death, which is kind of strange, you know. If I mean, if he can heal somebody that's in the throes of death, you know. But nonetheless. But here's what Jesus said to that woman. And here's what I'm saying to you tonight. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Mm -hmm. Now, if Jesus should tarry, and the day of our death does come, what can you do in the face of mortality, personally? Men can feign righteousness and these kind of things, but they can't feign power over death. What can you do at that time? You can do this. You can only believe. And I'm telling you right now, that will be enough. Because that is what this question in Psalm 89 has been all about from the beginning. Why does God face man with his mortality? Is so that he will honor a God that can do what no man can do by believing on him for life when he's dying. And I'm telling you, that honors Jesus. He said that in John 5. Remember why he gave him power in John 5? Why he gave him this power? So that all men would honor the Son even as they honor the Father. So let me encourage you with this because your, our day may be coming. We don't know when. But if it does come, and, and if you're asked to, you know, to kind of slowly go through this, whatever it may be, believe on Christ. Amen. Amen. He will not disappoint you. Because although this question is true of the human race, what man is he that liveth and shall not die? There is one that's immortal. And he's not going to die. And if you believe on him, he will not leave you in death either. Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm.